educated as well as all your brothers and sisters. Do I understand that? Yes. Nine of your siblings have college degrees, is that yes, so? Yes, that's correct. Uh-huh. Uh, and and uh, so you were a little girl and, and you lived in a white neighborhood? Yes, we did. Suburban Denver? Yes. Black people never came to your house? No. We yeah. didn't live in uh, Denver. We lived in a suburb called Westminster. East Denver, Northeast Denver is where blacks live. We lived in a suburb called Westminster. Uh-huh. Uh, and when did you first uh, did, uh, tell them about it? Was it your big brother, huh? Yes. Tell me. One of my brothers came home... Uh, when I was nine years old when this happened, one of my brothers came home and he was called a nigger at school. And he came home and my second oldest brother sat the four youngest children down and told them that we were black, but we were not going to go as black. And that it was our family secret and not to tell anyone else. So we just discussed it within the household, never outside. Huh. And uh, should we call this a closet? Yes. Yes. And when did you come out of the closet? I came out when I was 18, when I started college and wasn't around my family anymore. You felt an obligation to your family to continue the, shall we call it a lie? Well, I think at first we were taught to pass, and I also did feel an obligation. And also, when it first came out, I know when I was told, I just thought I was adopted. I didn't like it very much. I didn't like being black or being told that I was black. And then, and then when you became 18, you said, why don't I like this? This is what racism is all about. Is that pretty much? Yeah, when I went to college, I decided that that's what I was, was black, and I was going to see. Well, I kind of thought I was black and white, so I was going to see the other side. And did you wear uh, an afro and dashiki, or how, how did this blackness, this newfound interest in, uh, in being who you were, express itself? Well, first I tried to be political. I tried to join the black student union. I could not. The blacks would not let me join. So the only way I first came out as black is by dating black men. That's where I first started getting the culture and mm -hmm. learning about it. Uh, share with me just the, uh, the pressure here. Um, being black means a certain signature, a visible persona. And did you think you didn't have it? No. To to us, it, it wasn't like that. Passing isn't like that. Passing is when you're taught that if you expose a secret, you could end up dead. My mother told me and other people in, this, in the family, she taught us in her own way that if we exposed ourselves, that we could lose our lives behind it. She told a story about one of my sisters was is, is dead, and we would ask, how did Octavia die? And my mother would tell a story about how they lived in um, a uh, street on South May Street in Chicago. It was block by block integration. It had, and my parents lived in a white block, and at the end of the block there was a black church. Well, they were going as whites, and the way my mother told it is that some people found out that we were black. They broke out the window. My sister, who was premature, died of pneumonia. So when she told that story, it wasn't to say, you know, what it said to me as a child is that if the secret got out, that we could end up dead. That's the way I took it as a child. But my mom, sometimes, I think it really bothered her to pass. It bothered her a lot. Uh, when I was in the sixth grade, when I was 12 years old, I was in a, my sixth grade class, and there was a teacher there, and he was very racist. And Sammy Davis Jr. married Mae Britt, and he put up this um, newspaper article about that on the bulletin board, and he started saying some racist comments. And I said that I stood up and said I was black. So they put me out of school, got my mom in school, and said, you know, your child think, you know, need some help my mother stood up and said you know that we were black and she got that teacher expelled so there was a lot of times my mom seemed uh, like when i couldn't keep the secret she seemed to support me in it so i think it always really bothered her to pass and and where are you now with this uh what shall we call it dual identity what what tell me your f i don't have a dual identity i have two parents and both of them are light-skinned and black and I know my history well enough, I don't have an identity problem. I am, I am black, my consciousness is black, my concerns are about black issues and about black people. I have no problem with being black. I'm not multiracial, I'm not mixed, I'm black. Black and black makes black. So I don't have a problem with it. <laughs> Kathleen Cross. Um, you didn't try to pass. Never have. 
Uh-huh. My mother... Uh, my, my story is almost the exact opposite of hers because my mother is white and my father is black. But my mother raised me in the black community so that most of my role models, all the people that I loved, everyone, was black. And, and right now are black. It's not a denial of, of my whiteness, but it's an acceptance of, of my blackness and who I am and who I've always been. You say all your uh, mannerisms and experiences are from the black experience. I won't say all because I don't think that's true. I think I have gotten um, a lot of my mannerisms come from my mother. I say things and I've had things pointed out to me like I say I'm going to do my laundry and that's my mother and that's not a black term to say I'm going to do my laundry. But a lot of who I am and most of my mannerisms and who I am, the music I listen to. Um, and, you know, I talked about that in the article that I wrote, that I do not uh, adopt white culture as my own. And a lot of white people, I think, I'm sure there are people in the audience who think white culture, what's that? But if you're black, you know there's a difference between black culture and white culture. And you've been, certainly you've had a front row seat to racism against black people. Oh, certainly. Not unlike a, uh, a Jewish woman who marries an Irish guy and walks through life with an Irish last name and hears epithets at the bridge table That's where they're playing cards. That's right. I've had people tell me, and I had this woman tell me one time, she dates black men, okay, and told me she would never date a white man. and didn't really explain to me why, but she dates black men, and right now she's married and is raising an African-American child, or at least from my perspective, the child. She thinks the child is mixed, and that's a whole new race. But this woman told me she broke up with her last boyfriend because he was too black. And I said, well, what do you mean he's too black? She said, well, he's ignorant and doesn't want to do anything with himself. And I thought to myself, what is she doing here if that was her perspective of black people? She would never have said that to me if she'd remembered that I was black. She said it to me because she thought I was white. Mary, did your mother ever, was your mother ever expressing concern about your hair becoming kinky? Yes, my mother had a... Uh, my mother was in an orphanage, and uh, her mother uh, got pregnant by a black man in uh, 1915 and gave her up. And so she was adopted by white families. And uh, one family shaved off her hair and glued on a wig so she never could grow hair up in the front. So she had a real phobia about our hair going back home, and so we straightened our hair or in some cases kept it very short. Going back home? Yes. Your hair going back home... That's what she said. That's it's a euphemism term. for... Uh, That's her term. Using, uh, becoming uh, Negro-like. Right. What did she say? Mat it? Straighten it? What'd she say? She'd say, straighten it. Your hair's going back home. So we'd kind of have a straightening party. Everybody straighten their hair. Yeah. You know, you understand your mom, don't you? I understand her very well. I do. I... She wanted, she... Go with it, honey. It's tough enough. Get yourself in the white world. Don't If you don't have to take this card, don't take it. We My parents were realistic. There is racism. There was racism in 1990, whether people want to talk about it or not. My parents were realistic. It's, it's easier in employment, in housing, in education to go as white. They wanted their kids to make it. They wanted their kids to survive. They wanted their kids to have an easier life. And I don't down my parents for that. What I down is the society still today. Is the way that it is, racist, and doesn't want to talk about it, and doesn't want to deal with it, and doesn't want to tell the truth. Who has passed? My Who mother and dad passed, sometimes went as blacks. In Chicago, two times, they went as black. Then they went to Harvey, Illinois, and they were white. And then they were uh, black when they went back to Kansas. Then they were white when they went to really? Denver. Well, that's a very informative answer. Uh, uh, which I'm pleased to have on the record, it, you misunderstood my question, and it's the host's fault. I meant dead as in past. Is, does your, do your parents oh, survive? Oh, she's deceased, yes. She is, and your father lives, does he not? Yes, he does. And is not altogether thrilled with your militant stand-up, I'm a black person. My dad is still white. My dad is white. That's what he says he is. He's white, along with most of my family, is white. I, I assume you're forgiving of I don't know if that's the word. Forgiving? I mean, do you, un you understand this? Do you feel obliged to forgive him, right? I understand him, and I wished I could do my story. I wished I could change my birth certificate without it hitting national. I wished I could live my life without hurting my family, but that is not possible, and I'm not going to pass. I'm an adult. I have a right not to have to pass. 
I can't tell my story without involving them, and I'm sorry for that. I'm not out to hurt my family, but it's just the way it goes. You did change your birth certificate? Yes, I did. Big court brouhaha, wasn't it? No, it was not. My dad's birth certificate says black. Oh, so there was... But you did have to go to court? Yes. And uh, presumably a lot of gray-haired white guys had to get in the chamber somewhere and decide whether or not you could change your... No, to be honest with you, I don't think they wanted to mess with the story. They passed it right away. My dad's birth certificate is black. There's no question I'm black. But yours said white, did it not? Yes. And you've changed it to black? Yes. Rock Newman, you grew up being mistaken for white, Rock. It says here, you guessed with us again to speak to this very, very complicated issue. Um, and one that uh, you must feel that you get, it, you get it from both sides here. You, you have a painful seat in the front row to America's racist drama. How do you feel about that metaphor? Painful seat is a good way to put it. Uh, the, the issue that has that has always bothered me. There's never been a lack of, of acceptance of me in my own community. Always been very much accepted from early on, and I think that had something to do with what my... What kind of community was this? This is a black community. I grew up in a black community, had the support and the role models of a black community, and lived from the very beginning as a black man and always have and always will. Um, the, but the pain that you talk about is the naked, raw racism that I've experienced from white folks who did not know that they was talking to a nigger when they was talking about another nigger. Time and time and time again. Yeah. In and every you epsilon. you got to decide who you're going to blow the whistle on here. I don't mean to suggest that I understand this problem, but uh, how, do you, how do you give lessons to uh, a white person in their 40s at a cocktail party? Do you know what I mean? How did you handle it when people were flat, naked, racist in your company? Uh, I have not said a word and let them continue to talk. And I've punched them in the face. <laughs> Depend <laughs> Depend Depend depending on the particular situation. And my concern really hasn't been so much their education. It has been the embracing of my own community and the uplifting and the, and the, the teaching within my own community. Yes. I know, that our, our, I know that the attitude about us is not shaped by our skin color, it's by our attitudes. You know, Bill Cosby is a very dark man and he's very acceptable. Louis Farrakhan is a very light man and he's unacceptable and it's about attitude. Uh, I, I want to make sure I understand this. Uh, when someone is uh, baldly racist in your company, uh, I assume you feel twice uh, afflicted here. One, that this guy thinks you're white and can get away with this. And two, in his, in his honesty, which comes from his ignorance about your origin, he insults you again. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it is, it is rather difficult not to walk around with my fist balled up. Because I understand probably what some other people don't understand within my community. I get it, I can get it firsthand and have been involved with it very much firsthand. I'll guarantee you the person who has always said that to me wouldn't say it to someone in the audience who is darker. So I get the real feeling, I get the real racism yes, that exists. Yes, you do. You do, unadorned, un unrestrained That's and right. uh, without, uh, yeah. Uh, are you there, caller? Hi. Hello. Hi, Mr. Donahue. Um, I'm a product of an interracial marriage. My mother is white and my father is black. My mo my, I am very fair-skinned. I'd like to know, why must I be considered black? Why must I be considered white? Why can't I be who I am? I married a Greek uh, fellow, and all of my friends said, oh, you should have married a black guy. You're black. I don't consider myself black. I don't consider myself white. I am who I am, and I'd like to be accepted for that. May I uh, direct your attention to Benita Porter, who, among other things, many other things, has written a novel titled Color Struck, Your Word. Both your parents were light-skinned blacks, uh, Ms. Porter. You recall as a child your mother being ordered by white women to remove you from the colored section of the restaurant. Now that's, yeah, that's exactly what happened, but my grandmother was also with me. What had happened was it was in the 50s, and Woolworth lunch counter used to be divided with a little strip down the middle. Yeah. Black people sat in the back, white people sat in the front. And what happened was we went, we'd come from a day of shopping, and we had to wait because the black, the black section was filled. So I was tired of waiting. I was four years old, and I wanted to eat. So I kept telling my mother, I want to eat. Grandma, I want to eat. I want to eat. And they kept saying, no, you have to wait. 
Right. So finally, we did get to sit down, and when we sat down, this elderly white woman came up to us, and she began to scream at my mother, you should let this white child sit where she wants to sit. She has the right, she has the privilege, and she can't, she doesn't need to sit with you niggers. And that was more or less where it went. So that you was were most, how old? I was four. You don't, and you remember that vividly? Oh, very vividly. It was the first time that I ever recall anyone associating me with being white, because like Rock, I grew up in the black community exclusively. And the difference, I don't know how Rock's parents felt, but my father was the first person that I ever heard years before Malcolm X to call white people devils. My father had the most militant stance of anyone I have ever known. Could we call it racist, and would you accept that? I, I would say that in many ways that he felt, but, well, his situation was very special because he was born out of a race, and I think that that had such impact on him that he was never able to trust anyone that was white. And I should mention that both of my parents had a white, each had a white parent, and neither of them ever revealed that until we were all grown. They felt that the circumstances were too complicated. Black people can't be racist. Racism is an institution, and we don't control the institutions that allow us to be racist. Racist. We may we may have prejudices, but not racist. We are not racist. We cannot be racist. We don't control the institutions that allow us to be racist. Let us understand. I don't don't leave us, caller. Let us under. Let us try and understand here. Limited time that we have. The response of this audience to your observation. This predominantly, but not exclusively, white audience. When you say that, what bothered them? As you know, I'm a brilliant man and I'm, <laughs> I'm supposed to understand this, but maybe uh, I should give someone here an opportunity to say that. What bothered them? As you know, I'm a brilliant man and I'm, <laughs> I'm supposed to understand this, but maybe uh, I should give someone here an opportunity to say what bothers them about this last comment that, that the gentleman made, I have a stand up or yes. say, um, I, I believe your name is Mary, the first lady on the left. Well, wait a minute. Uh, did you go ooh and ah when Rock said, yeah. yeah, tell me how you feel. Um, well, Mary had made a statement that when she tried to go back into college and tried to get accepted into the black activist groups or right. whatever, they pushed her out. You don't call that racism? Because maybe because she passed or because she looked white or because there is a light skin, dark Rock skin racism. Back. Mary? Um, I'm not positive. I know what he's saying, but I'm not positive. I, I think racism is when you have a, prob, a, a prejudice against someone based on a stereotype or something. And I think it happens in the black community as well as the white community. I think light-skinned blacks get treated badly in the black community sometimes with the sisters and so on. So I think that uh, you do get treated differently because of the color of your skin and that's unfortunate i think black people need to address that in our own community i think well, it's mr. a problem newman, i think it's important mr newman to differentiate between racism and prejudice he does not deny that black people could be just as prejudiced as any other human person walking around but i think if i'm understanding you you're not going to sit there quietly while the white people suggest that blacks are racist because of the extraordinary difference between, in, in terms of the negative influence of white racism. Control of the institutions that manifest race, that we're in, which yeah. mani in which racism manifests I think itself. I understand that. Would you kindly speak to this woman on the phone who says, what is this about here? Why do I have to... Uh... I, think, I think that she can make her own choice. It might be more difficult when you have a white or a black parent. I interviewed 2,000 people for my book because I was very interested in understanding how everyone felt. I also interviewed white people. I asked them, how do you feel about me? I think a lot of the times, many people feel a need to identify. We live in a racist society. If it were an ideal world where nobody ever felt any kind of racial prejudice, then she'd be perfectly free to do or say whatever she felt like. But do I sense a sort of, there's a hostility, I think, in this caller's voice. So Tell I, me. Can I yes, ask by a all question? means. Okay, that is my experience. If anything, a lot of white people think, you look white. For all intents and purposes, you are white. Why not just be white? Why call yourself black? Why would you want to be Right, yeah, exactly. That's the, given that's the given all the privileges that exist in this country in being white. And when this woman says, why do I have to call myself black? She doesn't have to call herself black. That's not what this is about. It's about understanding. And, you know, bottom line is I believe in the oneness of humanity, as idealistic as that sounds. I hope you're right. As ideal, idealistic as that sounds, however, when you raise a child, particularly a biracial child, 
if there is such a thing as a biracial child. When you're raising a child whose parents are black and white, and you raise them to believe in the oneness of humanity, and everybody will accept you for who you are, you're setting that child up. Because when they get to the point where they recognize they're looked at as just another black person in America, they're going to get angry. They're going to be hurt. Yes. They're going to have to feel the pain of it. Yes, you're getting nods of affirmation from the rest of the panelists. Jolene Ivey, in advance of our break here, my apologies for taking so long to get to you here. You are often mistaken uh, for white. <clears throat> You've just had your first child. You were raised by your father, who was black, and you were raised in a black community, so? And my stepmother as well is black. Huh. Um, well, let me be a wise guy here and presume to uh, say what you must always hear. People are always saying, what are you? Well, usually people don't say, what are you? People, black people might occasionally say, what are you? But then they say, if I have to ask, I know you're black. But white people never ask, what are you? They just assume I'm white, and they just treat me like I'm white, and then they say the things that Rock is talking about. Right. And you're here to announce your blackness. Do I have the language right? This is like walking well, I on... I am black, yeah. Uh, as what? Why? Tell me the, the what motivates your personal commitment to this in a public way. Well, I guess it just bothers me that white people feel that they can just come up to people, anyone, you know, who they think is sympathetic, and they seem to think that white, other white people are sympathetic, and I'm not talking about every white person in this room, although I'm probably talking about a good number of white people in this room, who will say bad things about black people to me, and they think that I'm just going to say, oh yeah, that's cool, you know, and I don't, I don't let it go past. You it's call them. I call them every time. I feel like if they have to make me mad, I'm going to make them very uncomfortable. And it might not change what they say, but it's going to change how they behave. Also, she makes a good point about uncomfortable. Because I sometimes think that that's exactly what a person like me represents. It makes you uncomfortable. Because 99% of black people who look like me don't look this way because of a loving relationship between a black and a white person. Most of this sort of thing comes from slavery. And down, my father's born 35 years after slavery, but he lived on a tenant farm where part of his mother's payment was sex on demand. From, to, the, from the, the owner, owner of, of the, the plan, farm. yes. Exactly. Yeah. And, and she birthed three of his children, and my father took the beatings for that white man from his stepfather, who could not protect his mm -hmm. wife from this man. So your own research and your own heritage made you even more militant than Absolutely. quite obviously. Absolutely. Militant in the sense that I'm very proud of what I am. I mean, I have, no, I have no real objection if a person wants to categorize themselves as mixed race, except that I don't see a need for it. I don't understand it. It seems to me that black people are tremendously divided as it is. That's and right. to make more categories right. to, to, and to distinguish and then also many people who have a white parent don't look white not at all they they you know genetics are are completely unpredictable no one knows what will happen and we'll be back in just a moment <laughs> see here. Yes, ma'am. You know, I'd like to comment to the gentleman. Um, I don't think this is that much difference. I'm Jewish, and I've traveled to many places where people have a stereotype about Jewish people, and they look at me and they might make a racist comment about Jews. And I think I could be very constructive in what I say to them, as opposed to pitting them. I could say, um, <laughs> you know, I tell people I don't have horns in a tail, and I think you're wrong on your perception. So I think you have an opportunity to be very constructive. Why does everybody think that we have to yeah. go around instructing people about right. how to act? Right. They ought to know how to act. Why not? Don't put that, on, me. Not? Don't put that on me, okay? Right. Don't put that on me. Don't make, don't make me the animal when the animal is the one that's calling my brother a nigger. But it makes you a better don't, person. Don't, don't make it me makes the animal. you a better person. I'm the victim. I, I become the victim. Then you turn yeah. around and make me the killer. Uh, but so, this woman so that will agree, I think, that Jews would respond in as many different ways to these insults but you as can't would so called. Jew a mile away, usually. Uh, people are always trying to. People. No, no. Let, let me finish. People are always trying to, whenever you're on a show.
show or anything and you represent yourself as black or when blacks are talking about racism or talking about an issue, people from different nationalities or foreigners, hey, I come to this country and I make it, why can't blacks do it and everything? They try to take away from the issue. Just like right now, we are here to instruct. We are here to do a constructive thing just as human beings. But it is not all on us. Part of it is for white people to start facing their racism and that racism exists in 1990. I can, sympath I can sympathize with this woman. I think that um, as time goes on, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, and most of the black people are in the poor, poor area. Everything hits black yeah, I can see, I, harder, I see, uh, every issue. In Harlem, I mean, it's getting worse. And the problem is that these people have to rely on public education and education that's, um, that's budgets are being cut here in New York City. No, How are we going to educate these people? Of what's being worse is oftentimes shaped by a racist media institution media. that I'm talking about right. that we have no control over, that portrays blacks in five deadly ways that aren't necessarily true, more violent, less educated, less, wor less hardworking, less patriotic. All of those things are wrong. It's a how we look at ourselves and how we are appraised. If we appraise ourselves through that magnifying glass, that media magnifying glass, we will continue to be the under, be in the underbelly. That is just not, that's just not true, what you're talking about, how it's always getting worse everywhere. That's what's being presented to you, but not necessarily true. And unfortunately, most perceptions of black, of black people in white America is what comes on the tube, it's what you see in the film. And in the past, there was once a time when the only two projections for black female were the tragic mulatto and uh, the mammy, the sort of gone with the wind type person. And if, I, if my book does nothing else, I hope it dispels the whole mess of tragic mulatto because I'm anything, but I'm not tragic and I'm not walking around. I don't need a psychiatrist. I'm completely understanding of exactly what I am. Oh, I've, never, I've never needed it. All right? And a lot of people say that to me all the time. You must feel like you're going crazy. A, a lady interviewed me one time and she said, you must want to kill yourself every day. I said, I've never wanted to kill myself. I love myself. I'm completely clear on what I am. Are you there? Call her high. Yes, hi. Um, I'm a dark-skinned black woman and I was just wondering, what's all the brouhaha about uh, light-skinned, dark-skinned? Um, I think as black people, we all need to get together and try to solve our own problems and stop worrying about who's light, who's dark, who's better, who's worse. But the only thing with that is, if we, if we were in a world that didn't have a box, check white, check black, check whatever. I used to check black and white. I used to try that. Try it sometimes, and they'll tell you, pick a, pick a race. A computer but we're not won't in a world both. like that. that and I'm not be. saying that white should be, light or black should be, that's the message that we're trying to say, is we are black. And the black community has got to accept us. The white community has to accept us. What? If you want to be multiracial, fine. But you know one thing about that multiracial thing? If you ask an Italian person, you know, what race are you? They'll say Italian. Black's the only race I know where you have to sit there and say, I'm multiracial. I'm French, German, Indian, and black. So it tells me everybody wants to be, be everything, mixed, whatever, anything but black. What does that say? Is there something wrong with being black? I think, you know, I saw the, the audience gets a little upset when um, the question comes up of racism and white racism and not really being able to associate anything in their own life or their own experience as far as being discriminated against. The problem in this to me is that what we haven't addressed and what no one said is we live in a society where every single person in this room is sick with an illness. And that illness is called racism. We all have different symptoms of it. And what I mean by that is you, we are raised from the time where infants to believe that white is superior and black is inferior it's everywhere. It's in our literature. The, the bad guys wear black. It's everywhere. I have a little girl. My little girl was four years old, and I hear her say, I wish God didn't make me brown. And as a mother, I'm saying, what kind of society is this that my child has to wish she was something other than she was? And I have to go, I mean, I pray to God for the answer to give my baby. You know, that she's a beautiful brown child, not, and here's the answer a lot of people give, yes, honey, you're brown, but you're beautiful, and but you're smart, or no, you are brown. And you know what? I told her, I said, you know what? Some of God's most important things, some of the most important things he created are brown. And we talked about the color brown and how important it was. That's what I had to do for my child. It makes me angry that I live in a society where I have to do that. And, and the white people in the audience who cannot relate to that, I feel sorry for 
because you have an inherent feeling of superiority which no one ever calls you on. Phil, I and, and, think the white people in the audience share the uh, heartfelt uh, passion of your uh, statement. There, whatever appeared to be a negative response from the audience had to do with Rock's observation about uh, uh, seeming to uh, absolve uh, blacks of racism. That made them upset, and I think that's different. I'm not, I'm not citing an in that one, but that's different than what you say. And there's no, and I think most white people in the audience agree no, to the truth right. of what you if said. If I might advance one more thing that'll probably upset you also, <laughs> is that I see such blatant ignorance involved in the racism that I am speaking of. Because there's a body of evidence that is before us, historically speaking, uh, mathematically speaking, anthropologically speaking, that the original man and woman were Africans. Yes. And they were not Africans that looked like de Klerk or Botha. They were Africans that looked like Mandela. So if the original man and woman were Africans and were black, the audience, we're all audience, yeah, and we'll be back in just a Please send a postcard to Donahue Tickets, care of NBC, 30 Rockefeller Plaza, New York, New York, 10112. Remember, postcards only, please. Uh, Peggy McIntosh, a, PS, a Ph.D. from Wellesley uh, College, a uh, Center for Research on Women, makes the following points. Here are a list of white privileges that all of us, regardless of, uh, of our uh, ethnicity, origin, skin tone, anything else, should... Uh, be reminded of if you're white if I should need to move can be pretty sure of uh, renting or purchasing housing in areas which I can afford and in which I would want to live show them another one when told about the national heritage or about civilization if I'm white I'm shown that people of my color made it what it is next whether I use checks credit cards or cash I can count on my skin color not to work against the appearance of financial reliability if I'm white I do not have to educate my children to be aware of systemic racism for their own daily physical protection. Next. If I'm white, I can do well in challenging situations without being called a credit to my race. Imagine how patronizing. If I'm white, I am never asked to speak for all the people of my racial group. If I'm white, I can arrange to protect my children most of the time from people who might not like them. And if I'm white... Uh, the culture gives me little fear about ignoring the perspectives and power of people of other races. Want to do that? And I don't have to worry about racism without being seen as self-interested or self-seeking. How revealing that is. Yes. Hi. Um, I'm a student that's going to be applying to colleges very soon. And I was just wondering, it seems that a lot of black students, to make the, a lot of schools have quotas for the schools. And it seems that if you're black, a lot of times you have a better chance of getting in. And that's what... A lot of people are told. Please. Let me talk Go about me. that. Please do. Now, if 99.9% .9 of the people in that school are white, that's a whole big quota for white people. So if you all are just going to have one little small amount that you just have to give to black people, God, don't, don't hurt them too much now. Why do you all get insulted by that? that? The black people get this much while you all get this much all the time. Why does that bother you? Over here, please. I know you're all proud of your black heritage, and that's wonderful. But are you, how do you feel about your white backgrounds? Are you proud of them? Do you wish they weren't a part of your life at all? Well, I'd like, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'd like to say that, first of all, it's not, everybody wants to say that it's a denial. You know, if you, if you accept one, you're denying the other. Humanity is one. Mankind is one. And matter of fact, God created all of us from the same dust. So it's not a denial. It's an understanding of how you arrive at feeling good about who you are. And I think, and what I like to reiterate is that what, won't, what most white people don't understand is living in a society that says white is better. That why on earth, especially for me, why on earth would you choose to be black when white is so obviously better? If you have long blonde hair and blue eyes, you're the most beautiful. If you have straight long hair as opposed to kinky hair, you're the most beautiful. Everything in our society sets us up to believe that. So, yeah, if you think black people are angry about be living in a society like that, yeah, black people are angry that society is that way. It's not about hating white people. But yeah. you don't have to talk about your whiteness. It shows. Obviously, I have some white in me. I don't have to talk about that. That's like saying we have to have white history in the school. Of course we have white history. We don't have to talk about that. We have to, have to talk about having black history. 
You don't have to talk about your whiteness. It's show. Yes, ma'am. There's a, a lot of, uh, you know, talk here about the black community and um, with Hispanics, to my knowledge, have been, you know, uh, very much living in the black community. And they, I, I wonder, want to know why they're not here uh, on the panel well, today. Well, uh, we know, don't have any Japanese either. either. You know, you grew, uh, no, uh, you, you, you group minorities together. Minorities are supposed to include everyone, blacks and Hispanics. But the old saying about white is right. Brown, stick around, black, get back, is true. At the school that I worked at, they were on the black children, the Hispanics they could accept. White people can accept Hispanics, not that there's not a problem with Hispanics, but they still are more accepted than black people. Yes. So I this is a black issue. We are black. Yes. I have a comment for Rock. Rock, I agree with you. I wor lived and worked for almost all of my life in Portland, Oregon, and Portland being predominantly white, a lot of times, if you are the only black person in a white situation, they will say things to you because they think you're safe. You're obviously in with them, so they can, they can project their racism onto you, and you're supposed to laugh. I never hit anybody, but believe me, I wanted to. And to Kathleen, I want to say to you, um, I want to know how it was for you with black women in your community. Did they accept you or see you as a threat in a community that, that was predominantly dated white May women? May I ask you to save your answer? Very thoughtful question. We'll get your answer in just a moment. <laughs> Benita Walker's book is titled Color Struck. Look here. Um, here, here is a, uh, an account of uh, the story of people who are uh, conscious of the tone, the hue of their skin, and why are they, and what does it do to us, and how much of a, uh, of a canary in the mine uh, is this issue regarding the in infection that runs through America's bloodstream called no, racism. You certainly is. can. She asked you about women. Okay. I like to say that for me, I went to dinner one night with my husband on our eighth wedding anniversary with my three beautiful children. And I sat in a restaurant while two sisters dogged me out. <laughs> and they dogged me out. What is, what's he doing with her? And, but you know what? It hurt me. It the hurt me. sisters thought you were white? Yes. And they said, well, what is he doing with her? And you know, I hate that every time a brother, you know, every time I see a brother, he's with a white girl. Wait a minute, though. But for me, it's even more painful because I understand their anger. I understand why they're angry. And so it hurts me because they don't recognize my sisterhood with them. I recognize it, and so I understand where they're coming from. And I sat through the meal feeling, not only feeling their pain, but feeling mine, too. And the reason why I understand is because, uh, once again, they live in a society, we all live in a society that says, I must have an advantage by looking white. Certainly, I must uh, want to use it and to my do. advantage. You do and I do have an advantage. And you hate it that I you do, do. for that bad. reason. I you hate it that I live in a society that where, where there is such a thing as having an advantage because of the color of your skin. Yeah. I hate that those sisters, yeah. excuse me, I hate that those sisters had to sit there at that table and feel pain because of the color of my skin. I hate that the brother who, that I talked about in the article that was angry at me simply because my, my skin was white, because my skin caused him pain. The difference, when he talks about racism, the difference is black people are operating out of anger, out of hurt. White people are, are reacting out of a superiority. There's nothing for you to be angry at. Why are you angry at black people? Black people are angry because of the oppression. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Please, may I please? We'll get you in, I promise. Here we come. You'll be brief, I know you will. Yes, Phil, I'm an entertainer, and I'm very glad to be here today. And I'd just like to say to the panel and all to the audience, we must stop this hate. We got to stop this hate. I do thank you. Yes, sir. I feel very sorry that you, you're all so angry at white people because we all do get mistaken for different races. And I, I wish that you had met other people in your life and besides the people that you've obviously met. Yes, ma'am. I think there's racism everywhere, and you cannot pinpoint it on a particular race, but it depends on the individual. And I think that as long as we keep calling people black and white, that's when racism is going to continue. I know well, as you want to come. that happens, you let me know. Okay? We're, not making the, we're not making this racism. This panel's not making this racism. This was presented to us. We're, we're the victims. Racism also takes and you know, you're talking, about, you ha you're talking about the light-skinned blacks have the choice, really, to pass or whatever that they may have it made. You, you can't really choose when here you know what you are. You, you really okay. don't have that I choice anymore. You if you please. I just want to say that I feel very sensitive to what you're talking about today. As a white person, I, I hear, of course, all the prejudices and the, and the bigotry, and, and it frustrates me, and I very, very little time let it pass when I feel it, when I sense it's going yes, on. Yes, ma'am. I 
just, I just want to say that I think that it's very ignorant for you to say that white people get their impression of black people from television. How do black people get their impression of white people? Is Same it from way. TV? Same way. Well, that's no. wrong. White, yeah. Black but people have been working for press. white people yeah. the, for many, many people. years, and you do learn your employer. Yeah. Um, uh, it's a very different situation. I'll tell you what's... I'll tell you what's uh, you don't have to have contact yeah, with how us. About the, how about the evening news? You know, all those people going to jail with the coat over their head? What color I've seen am I? a lot of white people there, too. I live I'm in a white and a black community, and I'd, I think I'm not racist. I think a lot of people here are not racist. Most white people don't think they're racist. Most white people I do just not like think they're racist. I think the end of this hatred starts with education in the home and just to teach your children not to be racist in I school. I agree. I almost out of time. Yes, ma'am. I know you said that you have children. Do any of the rest of you on the panel have children, and how have you handled have their... Two. My husband is very dark-skinned, and both of my children more, reflect more my skin color than his. And when we go out together as a family, the entire world stops and looks at us. Over yeah. here, right? My oh. husband is here. And we Mine have, is here, too. Yeah, we have a, a son who's 10 months old, and he looks a whole lot more like me than like Glenn. And I think that's something we're both concerned about as he grows up. What is he going to have to deal right. with? Jolene's husband, would you kindly stand? Where are you? There you are. Thank you so much. Well, and Benita's husband. husband. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Better get up here. Uh, all right. I don't want the kids mad at me. Yes, with so little time. Hello. Okay, I was just going to say that I don't think black or white that you can stereotype or generalize that all black women treat you this way or all white sure. women or this way. I think it's... Kimbo Kohler. Uh, Color Struck may not appear in your basic uh, Main Street bookstore, at least not immediately, and it is available uh, at Post Office Box 95, Bronx, New York. The zip is 10462. Here is a very, very well-researched, uh, thoughtful account of the issue about which we speak today. These are the people who have to sit there and uh, see very close up. Let me just get back here. I, yes. You know, if we don't take care of this racial issue in the United States, we're not going to have to worry about Iraq or any of the other I countries agree. blowing us I apart. Agree. I think it's time to settle it all right now and maybe check the box American next time. <laughs> Let me just... May I share with this audience... This is important. Please, uh, please at least let's give some thought to this. Four million black people have simply disappeared from their records and have... And there is no evidence to conclude that they've died, nor that they have emigrated to uh, other countries. They have merely assumed new identities and disappeared into the white world. And still, you, uh, you let me get this in. This is, this is Benita's, uh, Benita makes these points in Color Struck. The 1980 survey conducted suggested that an average of 10,000 white slash black people per year take on a white racial identity. Who wishes to speak? I do. If you, if you doubt it, if you have any doubts about it, one of my interviewees, I interviewed her three years ago. She's an actress. She told me... She wasn't about to in let her blackness interfere with things. I saw her three weeks ago on a national soap. She bleached her hair, and she, she's in a hot bed scene with a white man. I guarantee you nobody thinks she's black, all right? Yeah. And all of y'all are now sitting here trying to figure out which yeah. one, I right? I see on these shows a lot of people <laughs> blaming everybody or people who are justifiably victims. But I'd like to say instead of problems, I think we should start talking about what the solutions are. You come up with them, you let us know, okay? You want to hear them. Maybe the answer is with our children. Maybe we need to teach our children 